Welcome to AETCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. My name is Dr. Jalin Antony. Today, I am talking about intercostal drainage or ICD, the tube thoracostomy. Tube thoracostomy is the placement of a tube through the thoracic wall into the pleural cavity. It is commonly referred to as chest tube. It is placed to evacuate air, blood, or other fluids that collect within the pleural space. The etiology of the air or fluid collection can be due to iatrogenic complication, infection, lung disease, malignancy, or trauma. Thoracic trauma accounts for nearly one quarter of all trauma related mortality. Some injuries require surgical intervention. Most injuries are treated non operatively. Injuries to the bronchi, chest wall, esophagus, lung, or trachea may lead to the presence of normal air or fluid in the pleural space. The use of a tube thoracostomy, that is a chest tube, in this situation may be diagnostic and therapeutic. Anatomy and pathophysiology The diaphragm and accessory muscles of respiration contract and generate a negative pressure within the pleural space on inspiration. Penetration of the visceral or parietal pleura due to injury disrupts this pressure gradient, allows air to enter the potential space between the pleura and result in pneumothorax. A simple pneumothorax is the accumulation of air that is not under pressure within the pleural space. It may cause the ipsilateral lung to collapse. The increased pressure in the thoracic cavity may push the mediastinum towards the non-injured side as air continues to accumulate and if there are no adhesions. This can cause angulation of the atrial junction, impairment of atrial filling, and the subsequent decrease in cardiac output manifest by hypotension. The presence of pneumothorax under pressure accompanied by respiratory or circulatory compromise is tension pneumothorax until proven otherwise and is an immediate life threatening. This is an X-ray of left sided tension pneumothorax. There are two important points to remember about a tension pneumothorax. It is a clinical diagnosis based on the patient's presenting signs and symptoms. Do not wait for a chest film to establish the diagnosis. The initial treatment of this entity is needle decompression or finger decompression followed by tube thoracostomy. A large bore needle is inserted in the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line at the superior border of the rib to prevent the injury to neurovascular structures. A gush of air will ensue if the patient has a tension pneumothorax and the symptoms will improve. This converts a tension pneumothorax to a simple pneumothorax requiring a chest tube for more definitive management. Indications The indications for a tube thoracostomy following blunt or penetrating trauma to the chest include presence of a chylothorax, hemopneumothorax, hemothorax, hydrothorax, simple pneumothorax, or tension pneumothorax. A chest tube may be placed prophylactically in patients with uh, penetrating injuries to the chest who do not have evidence of pneumothorax on initial chest radiograph that are expected to undergo endotracheal intubation and inner anesthesia. The medical indication for tube thoracostomy include an empyema, malignant pleural effusion, pneumothorax, pleural disease, and recurrent pleural effusions. Table for indication for chest tube insertion, bongo, pleural fistula, chest wall trauma, chylothorax, empyema, hemonemothorax, hemothorax, pneumothorax, pneumothorax, malignant pleural effusion, pleural effusion, pleural disease, forced neurosis, postoperative, tension pneumothorax, traumatic pneumothorax. Contraindications. The only absolute contraindication to performing a tube thoracostomy is in the patient who requires a open thoracotomy. Although there are no firm contraindication to performing a tube thoracostomy in a trauma patient, there are some areas of controversy. There is increasing interest in conservative management of smaller traumatic pneumothorax, particularly in blood trauma. There is less support for conservative management in penetrating. Tube thoracostomy remains the 
safest and most complete method of evacuating pneumothoraces and hemothoraces due to traumatic injury. There are several relative contraindications to performing a tube thoracostomy. These include the presence of skin infection over chest tube insertion site, echocardiopathy conditions, large pulmonary blebs or bullae, pulmonary adhesions located pleural effusions or previous tube thoracostomies. These patients may require CT or USG guidance to place the chest tube. Correct echocardiopathy before the chest tube is inserted if the placement is not required emergency. Equipment for a thoracostomy. Covid and iodine, thorax and solution, 10 to 20 ml syringe, block anesthetic solution with epinephrine, this one personally led on KN or 0.25 personal to vacuum, 25 or 27 gauge needle, 10 size scalpel blade, deadly clamps, chest tubes, size 12 to 42 French, serial water, chest tube drainage apparatus with water seal, Christmas tree connector, section source, a needle driver. Myosis, which is large carod, suture material, petrol atom goes four and four go squares, adhesive types, sterile drapes, sterile gloves and gown, surgical cap, face mask with googles and face shield. Chest tubes used in emergency department are hollow, clear, straight plastic tubes. The distal end of the chest tube has numerous fenestrations or holes that allows the passage of air of fluid into the tube. A radio opaque strip allows for radiographic localization of the chest tube after it is inserted into the patient. The proximal end of the chest tube is beveled to allow it to fit better on a plastic connector. This is our chest tube. The proximal end is beveled and the distal end is fenestrated for a section of the air and the fluids. Chest tubes are available in numerous sizes. The lower the number, the smaller is the size of the chest tube. A spontaneous pneumothorax may be drained with a 18 to 26 French tube in adult, 14 to 16 French tube in children, 12 to 16 French tube in infants and small children, and 18 to 12 French tube in neonates. Traumatic pneumothoraces are usually drained with 28 to 32 French tube in adult and a 16 to 20 French tube in children. Chromatic hemothoraces, chromatic hemoneumothoraces and empyema require large size tubes. A 36 to 42 French tube in adult and a 20 to 24 French tube in children will provide adequate drainage without becoming occluded by the blood cloth or virulent material. Patient preparation. Explain the risk and benefits, complication, and aftercare to the patient and the representative time. And patient's clinical condition permits. Obtain informed consent for a tube thoracostomy for a document and medical record. Develop discussion whenever possible. There has been considerable discussion in the literature regarding the use of antibiotics in patients requiring a tube thoracostomy for trauma in the hope of preventing an empyema. Studies support a recommendation of administering first generation cephalosporin intravenously just before making the skin incision and continuing the intravenous antibiotic for hours. The administration of parent analgesic sedative for physical sedation, if not contraindicated, will be greatly appreciated by the patient as the procedure is quite painful. Employ the appropriate protocol for patient monitoring. Place the patient on cardiac monitoring. Non invasive blood pressure curve, pulse oximeter, supplemental oxygen to monitor them during and after the procedure. And frequently check these vital signs. Place the patient supine or semi erect, the arm on the involved side raised away from the chest. Identify the fixed interpersonal space in the mid axillar line to the anterior axillary line. Consider making this point on patient's skin with a pen or marking pen. Consider placing a soft Restraint around the wrist to prevent the arm from moving during the procedure. This is the image of the session for tube thoracostomy. 
apply powdered iodine or chlorhexa solution to the chest wall and allow it to dry so it's the real drive to the market is the real field then to identify the fifth intercrustal space in the mid axillary line the anterior axillary line this is the preferred site for chest wall insertion the reason for this is two uh, things the diaphragm rises during respiration to the level of the nipple and chest tube insertion below the fifth intercostal space and severely risk puncturing of the diaphragm abdomen organs the area of the mid axillary line is the least muscular area of the chest wall and is thus an easier area from which to gain access to the cavity infiltrate local anesthetic solution into the chest wall and cavity patient is awake and aware of the surroundings they should be performed regardless of whether the patient receives parenteral analgesics sedatives or sedatives approximately 10 to 20 ml of local anesthetic solution with nephrin is required to provide advocate analgesia consider using bupivacin as it provides longer analgesia than ritalin be aware of the maximum weight mixed volume of local anesthetic solution administered to when toxicity raise a subcutaneous field of local anesthetic solution run in the space below the one to be used to insert the stone that is the sixth intercostal space infiltrate local anesthetic solution subcutaneously and upward to a point above the fifth intercostal space ensure the needle goes just above the upper border of the rib to avoid the neurovascular bending and the bottom edge of the rib above redirect the needle to anesthetize the intercostal muscles for a little power of the fifth intercostal space advance the needle into the pleural cavity and inject to to the end of the anesthetic solution to adequately anesthetize the pleura this is the image of infiltration of local anesthetic solution in the chest wall and pleural cavity uh, the procedure wise the technique described here is an open technique as to the employing use of procor Procorated insertion of chest tube is associated with higher incidence of major complications and does not result in any significant saving of time. Make a three to five centimeter incision with a pen-sized catheter blade over the rib, one intercostal space below the desired intercostal space, that is, six intercostal space. Bluntly dissect the tract or tunnel within the six-inch ileal clamp in the subcutaneous tissue in a spherical direction to the rib bone. Orient the clamp with tip curved towards the skin. Advance the closed tips of the clamp in one centimeter increment and open the jaw to the dissected tract. The tract should terminate at the upper border of the fifth rib. This will avoid injury to the neurovascular bundle. Briskly push the closed tip of the clamp. the intercostal muscles and parietal pleura into the pleural cavity this maneuver requires significant amount of force to enter the pleural cavity the twisting motion as the clamp is advanced may facilitate the penetration into the pleural cavity because the intercostal uh, muscles is this is difficult if the clamp is advanced slowly loss of resistance associated with the rupture of air or fluid occurs when the chest tube enters the pleural cavity the fluid contained within the pleural cavity may exit the tract forcibly if under pressure it is important not to plunk too deeply with the clamp as the pleural cavity is ended the tip of the clamp can injure the diaphragm great vessels heart or lung the forward motion of the clamp can be partially opposed by placing the non dominant hand on the underside of the clamp and applying counter pressure away from the patient as the clamp enters the pleural cavity spread the jaws of the clamp to enlarge the tract through subcutaneous tissue intercostal muscles and parietal pleura insert a finger through the tract and into the pleural cavity feel the lung as it expands with inspiration and contract with expiration rotate the finger to ascertain the presence or absence of adherence gently break any loose adhesion between the lung and thoracic cage with the finger dense adhesion require chest to be inserted on another side then our step is to prepare to insert the chest tube for that we estimate the distance from the skin incision to the apex of lung by laying the chest tube over the patient apply a clamp onto the chest tube the estimated site at which it should exit the skin incision 
This location should be 4 to 5 cm proximal to the fenestration in the chest tube. Cut off the gravel proximal end of the chest tube just above the gravel. Grasp and clamp the tip of the large kelly clamp onto the distal end of the chest tube. Insert the tips of the clamp and chest tube to the tract into the pleural cavity. Use the clamp to direct the tip of the chest tube posteriorly and superiorly. Alternatively, the dominant index finger can be placed through the tract to direct the chest tube. The use of the finger in the tract is preferred method to guide the chest tube. The finger will be able to confirm the proper interpural placement of the chest tube. Release the Kelly clamp and advance the chest tube until all the penetration are within the pleural cavity. And replace the clamp on the chest tube is at the skin incision. Hold the chest tube securely in place. Remove the Kelly clamp from the incision and release the clamp from the chest tube. This is how we insert the chest tube. Secure the chest tube with uh, one zero silicon or nylon suture. The tube should be sewn in such a way that the incision is closed tightly around the tube to assure a better seal and that routine movements of the patient should not be dislodged. It. The first stitch has a simple interrupted uh, stitch and leave both ends of the suture long after tying the knot in the first stage. Wrap the needle end of the suture firmly around the chest tube three or four times. Tie a knot in the suture to secure the chest tube to the skin. Place the second stitch as a pure uh, string suture encompassing the chest tube. Leave both ends of the suture long. Wrap both ends of the suture around the chest tube and tie a bow, not a knot. This stitch will be used later to close the skin incision after the chest tube is removed. Place a simple interrupted or horizontal mattress suture to close the remainder of the skin incision. Apply an occlusive dressing over the incision site. Play the full atom brush over the incision site and around the chest tube as it exits the incision. Uh, then standardized procedure for finger or tube for a stem. This is uh, chest tube locations. The chest tube tip can be directed toward the pleural cavity apex or base. Direct the chest tube typically with its tip above the aortic notch for a pneumothorax. And direct the chest tube basically uh, with its tip just above the diaphragm for hemothorax. Because for, for pneumothorax, air will be collected in the apex. And in hemothorax, it will be collected on the, uh, towards the gravity or collected on the base. Aiming superiorly decreases the likelihood of chest tube placement in the length picture. Attach the open end of the tube to a combination fluid collection water seal suction device with 20 to 30 centimeter uh, water of suction. If a significant hemothorax is known to be present, or if a large amount of blood starts to drain immediately, consider collecting the blood in a apparinized auto transfusion device so that it can be retained to the patient. On assessment, obtain a AP uh, portable chest radiograph. Observe the position of the chest tube. Remove the chest tube and insert a new one if it is bent, inked, or in fissure of the length. If its tip is against the mediastinum, unsecure the tube and withdraw it a few centimeters and resecure the tube and obtain a repeat radiograph. Remove the chest tube and insert a new one if it is in subcutaneous tissue. Otherwise, it will cause subcutaneous emphysema. Observe the fenestration on the distal end of the chest tube in the radiograph. They are almost within the thoracic cavity. If not, remove the chest tube and insert a new one. Never advance a chest tube further into the thoracic cavity after obtaining a chest radiograph to prevent the cracking infectious material into the pleural cavity. Persistent bubbling in the system or a failure of the lung to re-expand indicates a leak in the system. Check the system to ensure that all connections are secure. Place a tape over the connection to eliminate the leak and to prevent the 
components from becoming dislodged. Check the tubing for any holes or fissures. Examine the chest tube and the radiograph to confirm that all fenestrations are within the thoracic cavity and replace the chest tube if all fenestrations are not within the pleural cavity. An injury to the trachea, mainstem bronchus, a large bronchiole or the esophagus can cause persistent air leak. A second chest tube can be inserted to keep up the leak and prepare the patient for bronchoscopy or esophagoscopy to diagnose the etiology of the persistent air leak. Large or persistent air leaks usually represent proximal tracheobronchial injuries and may require urgent surgical intervention. Any persistent air leak should prompt a surgical concern. Check the chest tube and the collection tubing periodically for blockage. The tubing may be milked or stripped to elevate the blockage and avoid the need to replace the chest tube. Milking refers to a forcing air fluid or clot back into the chest. Stripping refers to creating a negative pressure within the tubing to move the fluid or clot distally into the collecting chamber. Leave the chest tube in place on a suction at least 24 hours after all air leaks have stopped or until the drainage is serous or less than 200 ml per 24 hour if placed for hemothorax. However, in two intubated patients, maintain chest tubes throughout the mechanical ventilation to prevent the sudden development of new, new, new pneumothorax. During chest tube removal, be prepared to replace the chest tube if planning to remove the chest tube. Have all the necessary equipment and supplies readily available in case the patient urgently requires a new chest tube. Place the patient supine or semi recumbent position and carefully remove the tape securing the chest tube to the chest wall. Instruct the patient to inhale or exhale fully and hold their breath. This result in a well salver type maneuver and will prevent the ambient air from being drawn through the chest wall into the pleural cavity. Quickly and smoothly remove the chest tube while the assistant cinches down the knot of the suture to seal the skin insertion. Tie additional knot to secure the first string suture. Place petrolatum jelly or topical antibiotic ointment over the incision. Cover the site with a gauze square and tape it securely. Observe the patient for 4 to 6 hours for any signs of cardiovascular or respiratory compromise. Obtain expiratory posterior anterior and lateral chest radiograph if the patient remains asymptomatic. Evaluate the radiograph for the presence of or recurrence of a hemothorax, hydrothorax or pneumothorax or pleiothorax. Complications Tube thoracostomy is often described as a simple procedure. However, a chest tube can result in serious complication if it is not performed with care and attention. An unusual occurrence of sudden death following chest tube insertion has been reported. It was attributed to hemorrhage near the vagus nerve, causing irritation and stimulation of the vagus nerve and refractory bradycardia. Injury to the thoracic duct from the chest tube being inserted too deeply can result into pilothorax. Injury to the heart and great vessels can occur if the chest tube is placed anteriorly or a trucker was used to insert the chest tube. Lung injury can occur if the clamp clunks inward or entering the pleural cavity. Other complications associated with chest tube placement and removal include recurrent residual and loculated pneumothoraces. This may require the placement of additional chest tube. Placement of chest tube too high can result in a Horner syndrome or subclavian artery occlusion. The wrong intercostal space can be identified and chest tube insert too high or low. Lung can herniate through the insertion site. The chest tube can compress and injure the long thoracic phrenic cadalinar nerve. The retained hemothorax may require decortication and may develop into an empyema. The lung may not expand due to the bronchus being plugged. An allergic reaction can occur to the skin preparation local anesthetic solution or tape. 
post traumatic empyema remains a serious complication of thoracic trauma with incidence ranging from 2 to 25%. The etiology of the infection is not always clear. A break in the sterile technique on chest tube insertion, nosocomial pneumonia, superinfected pulmonary contusion, and undrained hemothoraces have all been implicated. Empyema attributed to chest tube insertion are completely preventable complications that can be avoided by strict adherence to aseptic technique. Other infectious complications include chest wall cellulitis, necrotizing fasciitis. Another complication like bleeding can occur from several sites. Instant site bleeding is often due to supervision venules and arterioles. The application of pressure and suturing the incision close will elevate this bleeding in most cases. An intercostal artery or vein can be lacerated if the dissection or penetration into the pleural cavity occurs along the inferior surface of a rib. Securing the chest tube against the inferior surface of the rib may tamponate the bleeding. The attempt to tamponate the bleeding with the Foley's catheter if it is continuous bleeding. Insert the Foley's catheter into the pleural cavity and inflate the cuff and withdraw the catheter to lodge the inflated cuff against the posterior surface of the rib. By doing this, we can control the bleeding. Another option is to extend the incision to expose and ligate the bleeding vessel. Lung injury and bleeding from penetration into the pleural cavity are often self-limited and minor. Rarely will an injury be serious enough to warrant the surgical intervention. A trucker should never be used as the risk of injury to the intrathoracic structure is significantly increased. The chest tube can become occluded and stop functioning. A large tube should always be inserted if it is purpose to drain blood, clot and purulent material. Attempt to milk or strip the tubing as described previously. Otherwise, a, a small tube inserted it is easily to get uh, blocked. Obtain a chest radiograph to determine if the chest tube is skinny. Twist the chest tube 180 degree and release it. If it spins back into its original position, it is skinny. Remove the chest tube and insert new one if the occlusion cannot be dislodged or the tube is skinny. Subcutaneous emphysema is the other complication. It results from uh, air entering into the subcutaneous tissue from an inadequately decompressed pneumothorax that tracks into subcutaneous tissue or a misplaced chest tube. Ensure that the chest tube drainage system suction source are functioning properly. Replace any component that is not functioning. Verify that the chest tube is within the pleural cavity and not within the subcutaneous tissue using the either plain chest radiograph or ultrasound. Evaluate the chest radiograph to ensure that all of the distal draining holes are within the pleural cavity and not within the subcutaneous tissue. Re-expansion pulmonary edema occurs from rapid expansion of a lung that has been collapsed for over 48 to 72 hours or from the removal of a large pleural effusion. Patients will begin to experience increasing shortness of birth and hypoxemia within a few hours of the procedure. Repeat the chest radiograph will show expanded lung with pulmonary edema. The exact etiology for this complication is unknown. This complication may be prevented by slow expansion of a lung and the removal of the pleural fluid in increment. Treatment includes supportive care, supplemental oxygenation, and positive pressure ventilation. Diuretics have no role in relieving this re-expansion pulmonary edema. Re-expansion pulmonary edema has associated with mortality of up to 20%. The source of pain for a patient with a tube thoracostomy are numerous. These include the skin incision, subcutaneous dissection, intercostal muscle transection, the chest tube, and the underlying injury. Pain can usually be managed with a combination of oral, parenteral, and topical analgesics. Sedative may recur, but can often be avoided with adequate pain management. Intrapleural BP vaccine has been found to be effective in reducing pain. 
administered 20 to 40 ml of 0.25 percentage Mipivacaine through the chest tube and into the pleural cavity. Clamp the chest tube or the tubing for up to 10 minutes to allow the Mipivacaine thoroughly coat the pleural cavity. Carefully monitor and observe the patient to ensure that they do not have the pleural tension pneumothorax while chest tube is clamped. Unclamp the chest tube and allow the excess anesthetic to drain into the collection system. This can provide several hours of pain relief to a patient who may have limits or contraindication to parental analgesics. In summary of the tube thoracostomy, tube thoracostomy is useful in treatment of thoracic injuries resulting in chylothoraxis, empyema, hemothoraxis, hydrothoraxis, pneumothoraxis. Attention must be paid to observe sterile technique, choose the proper insertion site, carefully enter the pleura and verify entry via digital examination. Employ appropriate drainage system to assure maintenance of a closed water tight system. Monitor the patient regularly while chest tube is in place. Emergency physician performing this procedure should be cognizant of the serious complications that may be associated with the tube thoracostomy, some of which are directly related to the insertion technique. Adherence to the principle described above will assist in avoiding many of these complications and provide optimal care for victims of thoracic trauma. Thank you.